Hi, it's Mary Beth Decker with sacredgrove.com. And I'm here with Elizabeth Harvey. Uh, we are gonna talk about one of the hardest subjects I've wanted to write a blog about for a while. And it's uh, about how hurting animals has haunted me. I was gonna be like more generic, but I'd rather talk about my experience. Um, and so, I am hoping that what we share here today opens up some thoughts for you. And, um, and also because I've got Elizabeth here, some ways to experience some healing for us in, in animals. And so, yay. Um, so before I introduce Elizabeth a little bit more, I just wanna say here, here are the things that got me to talk about the subject. I, when I was in, in college, I took pre-med training. And uh, one of the things that we had to do was do surgery, physical surgery on, on small animals. And why, why would you make 20 year old kids work on little mice, rats and turtles and what that teaches you is beyond me. Um, and they all passed away. We did use anesthesia, but they were terrified. I, I know there was pain. And I wondered what the heck did, what were we doing here? And that has always haunted me. Holy cow. I'm still, I've done a lot of, of, of things to help, but you can, I hope you can feel how much that bothers me still. And then as I got smarter about, you know, well, where else is it? I think dissecting that dead frog, how many frogs? I know it doesn't seem like a big deal, but if you love listening to frogs in the springtime when they're all talking back at each other and you think, how many frogs lost their, and I'm gonna say it this way, lost their lives for some little dummy high school. I mean, I like looking at them, but not when I think about how many have been lost their lives for. And, and then um, I even have to say, I was doing a lot of shamanic training. And after I became an animal communicator, I went back and thought about the fact that I made this beautiful drum out of cowhide. And we never addressed any way of saying thank you to the animal. Here we are in a shamanic setting where you think you're, you're communing with nature. There was never a time where we said thank you. Thank you for the gift of your life to give us this, to turn this into these wonderful drumming I thought, wow, there is, there's no listening or thoughts about this in, in a lot of areas of life. So uh, I, I'm stuck with the memories and the guilt, uh, even though I, I'm working through them. I've thanked my drum and I've thanked those animals, but I'm really wondering how we heal our wounds. And so I'm bringing Elizabeth in and let me just tell you a little bit about uh, Elizabeth. So hold on, and I'm going to let you talk soon. <laughs> I, I asked Elizabeth to come and do this after she shared his story. Uh, when you found that just the bones of a horse that looked like it had been dumped in the desert, a, a carcass. And um, that story that she shared, uh, that you shared, Elizabeth, and how you honored that horse's spirit, even after the fact, was breathtaking to me. And so you have more wisdom to share with us in this area. So a little bio, Elizabeth Harvey's art and poetry focus on recognizing people, animals, and land that have been abused or overlooked, as well as seeking more reciprocal relationships with nature. I love this language to include healing for both humans and the rest of the natural world. Elizabeth works as a licensed mental health counselor, coach and consultant in New Mexico. She re received a BA in Romance Languages from Washington and Lee University. 
close to home for me, and an MA in clinical mental health counseling from New Mexico State University. Her additional training is focused on eco-psychology, human-animal interaction, narrative therapy, grief, and trauma. My hope is that you can help us give us some ideas on how to talk about this and start healing our wounds. So Elizabeth, welcome. Thank you so much, Mayor Beth. It means so much to me that you invited me to have this conversation with you because these are all topics that I've been working through in my own life over a long period of time. So, you know, I appreciate you sharing what that's been like for you and the chance to have this conversation. Thank you. Um, I have to tell you, honestly, I didn't even have, I didn't even Google it because I'd rather hear it from you. I don't know what eco-psychology or narrative therapy are. So could you talk a little bit about that? I would love to, and I'm glad you're asking because they really tie into some of the topics we're going to talk about today. Um, eco-psychology is a discipline that marries up ecology and psychology. And it's based in ideas of human well-being being tied in with the well-being of the rest of the natural world. And I say it that way for a reason, because humans are part of nature. There are many schools of thought in which humans are above nature. It's very hierarchical. We're very separate from nature. And eco-psychology lays a foundation for us finding our place amongst the animals, the landscape, the plants, everything else that exists. We're not dominating it, we're part of it. And so to me, that opens the door to seeking a reciprocal relationship that's less based on using and exploiting natural resources as we call them sometimes, and more about relationship. And you know, a writer, David Abram, called it the more than human world in an effort to kind of counterbalance the way it's been for so long. That's beautiful. I, I mean, that's where I'm at. Mm -hmm. that, that, I didn't know there was a discipline. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm so pleased. <laughs> yeah, and, and just to mention it, because I think we'll draw from these ideas in our conversation, but there's a, an amazing book by Robin Wall Kimmerer, who is a scientist and a person of indigenous heritage. And she really, that's really where I became more aware of these ideas of reciprocal relationship with nature and the healing possibilities there. Her book is called Braiding Sweetgrass and it's just an incredible book. Thank you. Yeah, we'll see. Uh -huh. we'll, we'll probably yeah. find a link to that somewhere and share it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so you also asked about narrative therapy and that's something that I incorporate in my counseling approach. And I've also begun to incorporate that in work related to connecting with nature. And it's, it does have some very specific um, techniques and interventions in the counseling world. Um, but in general, the idea is that we all have a story of ourself and it's shaped by many voices. Uh, when we think about who we are and how we would tell our story and even internally, not just to others, we can, we can identify messages that we received early on in our life that may not be true to the core of who we are, yet we carry them with us. Um, sometimes those are messages of inadequacy in some way, or you always do X, or you know, having a certain thing going on, anxiety, depression, we think that's who we are. Narrative therapy provides a framework for saying, those are external. I am not my anxiety. I am not my guilt. And having a way to separate that out of the story. Um, in, in narrative therapy, that's called an externalizing exercise. But so then you can think about your story in a more deliberate way in what you want it to be. That can bring so much hope for the future when we think about what our story could be. And um, so to me, this is where 
relationship with nature and animals can really come in in a beautiful way where we co-create this story together um, in a reciprocal way. And that, that way of relating can change how we feel about ourself and how we relate to others. That is, um, I, I, I'm just so pleased and, and actually excited because um, that is what I'm trying to do for myself is co-create with what's going on in, in the natural world and come up with mm -hmm. a, a story that works for me about mm -hmm. how we're going and how as a human race we're going to survive and uh, keep mm -hmm. Yeah, wake up every day and say thank you for this lovely planet, and uh, mm -hmm. they, we still got it going. And I, mean, I read a lot of science fiction, and so and it's a lot of it is so human based, uh -huh. and it takes away all the lovely stuff that we take for granted. I think I'm not sure that I want to survive in, into that. I don't want to. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be in that future. Mm -hmm. is, it can be a different a story, story. right? Yeah. It, yeah, I, this is this is the future I want to keep going. Um, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So thank you. Um, excuse me for just a second. I got to close the door. Okay. My dog. I had the door slightly open and my dog snuck in and oh no, it's now it's open. Now it might have been outside the door too. You got yours? Okay. All right. So we may yes. we may be adjusting a few times. Thank you. Um uh, and I love that because I know I've done a lot of uh I guess I've done some narrative where I, I'm recreating my part and who I am. Mm -hmm. In, mm -hmm. in my own story. And um, mm -hmm. so something must have drawn you to this focus. Um, I'm, mm -hmm. is, are there personal experiences with the animals that got you to be in this area, working in this mm -hmm. place right now? And can you share yeah. that with us? Absolutely, I'd love to. It's, it's been a long, long journey. Um, I grew up here in New Mexico and my family is a farming and ranching family. So I had the opportunity to spend a lot of time in nature and with animals growing up. And um, that was a wonderful chance to get to know nature better and connect with animals. Um, at the same time, you know, my family raises um, cattle for beef. And uh, so that's, I've come to kind of a, a different place. It's been a really long period of evolution for me um, in which now I no longer eat meat and I have a different experience of animals. And uh, that's been a very long path that's just really become more prominent in my life in the past five years or so. Um, counseling is, is my second career and I lived in the DC area for about 20 years uh, working in government. And then I moved home to New Mexico, went back to graduate school and got into counseling. And uh, that happened concurrently with having more time and opportunity to spend in nature. And uh, so that really reawakened those interests for me, but it was also informed by what I was learning in counseling about relationships and healing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I think kind of a key point was as I was beginning grad school, uh, we adopted a dog and her name is Sammy and you know about Sammy. And uh, she had, she had really been abused. She was emaciated. She had giardia, she had kennel cough, she was in terrible shape when we got her and very traumatized. And she would not leave my side. I started calling her my golden shadow because she just was glued to me. She would not let me leave the room without her. If I tried to go somewhere, 
she was barking, crying, just had terrible separation anxiety. And uh, we didn't know this was gonna happen, but so we tried to work with her the best we could. Um, and it just so happened that at that time, uh, my son was about four and I've told this story with his permission before, so I'll tell it You're again. Ready. But he, um, he was really struggling to go to school. He had terrible separation anxiety and dropping him off at school was a huge thing. And we had to kind of take a break from trying to start school because he just, it was too hard on him and it was too hard on me as a mom. <laughs> but so enter Sammy, um, our dog. And we started bringing her in the car with us everywhere because she could not have us leave without her. It was too hard on her. Yeah. And uh, lo and behold, my son just took to that so much having her with him that over a short period of time, if she was with us, he somehow became comfortable with getting dropped off at school if she came in with us to drop him off. And that was just miraculous because it had been so hard leading up to that. And so that was, you know, gradually we were able to build on that to where he was okay going to school. And it was a big she's deal. she's really proud of herself for being that <laughs> helpmate. I can almost feel it, her saying, I did good, didn't I? <laughs> yeah. And then over time, she got better too. Her health problems healed. Mm. She, that just the hypervigilance she had really began to decrease as she became more comfortable with us. She eventually was fine staying at home when we went somewhere. And uh, even four and a half years later now, she... I still see progress from her in kind of some of the trauma falling away. It's incredible. That's but right. that was really such a lived experience of reciprocal healing that it was life changing for me. And uh, so during that time, while I was in counseling in grad school, I really started digging deeper into the field of human animal interaction. And, uh, you know, I think another really important formative experience for me while I was in grad school was going to do a training on grief. Uh, it's called Compassionate Bereavement Care, and it's very focused on supporting people who've been through traumatic bereavement. And it's mindfulness-based. And um, the person who developed this approach, Joanne Cacciatore, um, is a professor and then priest and in tandem with this approach to grief, she started a care farm, um, which is a farm where she has brought rescued animals. And so grieving families go to this place and the animals are healing and the people are healing. Oh, and it's beautiful. Yeah, and, and she's a Zen priest and this, this whole thing is based on the concept of ahimsa which is a concept that's common to Buddhism, Jainism, Hinduism of nonviolence towards living things. And so she's, she's vegan and very active about that. And um, again, that was a life-changing experience to see that model in action. And uh, that influenced me quite a lot. And that was kind of that was another point along the way on a move towards vegetarianism for me, um, which is where I've ended up. Yeah, I have too. And I'm, 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 I'm working towards vegan, but I, I'm not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've heard veganism described as aspirational, and I like to think about it that way because it's, it can be hard and overwhelming to do everything at once. It's. Uh, I love that. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean you don't care or you don't want to be better. It's, I think it's these changes are a practice and we accept ourselves where we are and we hope for better and, and make changes as, as we can you know, and as we more. 
that really works for me because like uh, I think about I want to be I want to be an unconditionally loving personal person. That is definitely aspirational. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, right? I'm like, not achieving um, that, but I'm I'm uh-huh. interested in moving in that direction. Yeah. I could do that with the idea of of uh, less and less um, moving towards vegan. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, I, that's how it makes me, me feel too. better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think you know there can be a lot of pressure that we put on ourselves, and it that does spur positive changes, and that's good. But you know. We want it to be sustainable. And, you know, for me, I had existing food intolerances, gluten, dairy. So I'd already had to make huge changes and, you know, it changes the way you can eat in restaurants. It changes how you shop. And so I had some practice with that, but it also fur- further narrowed what I could eat. I mean, you, if you look at a restaurant menu, <laughs> there might be one thing. So, you know, to me, gradual was more sustainable and I'm still committed to improving and, you know, think about animal products and clothing and that sort of thing. And so to me, sometimes it's a phased approach can be sustainable. Most people can't afford to wholesale, get rid of everything and replace everything at once. It's more like where it's sustainable if you've had you know, for me, a pair of boots for years. And when I wear them out, I'll think about how to replace them in a way that fits. But it's, I'm not going to necessarily throw everything away and start from scratch. For some people, they do. And that's, that's where they're called. And it's yeah. important. Uh, but I think it's important for each person to do what's manageable and sustainable and not punish themselves on this path. And I think what I also like about that is um, it's a way of life that you we would like to, uh, how do we say it? Invite others to consider. Mm-hmm. And one thing that turns people off really fast is holier than thou. <laughs> you know, like, look how good I'm doing, you know? Yeah. So it doesn't, it seems to me as, as I have to be who I am and yet I don't feel, I want to be in a place where I'm, I'm compassionate and remember that I am not, I haven't reached that sainthood version of a his mouth. And so I want to be transparent about this is I got I moved ahead, but I'm I'm not there yet. And so I'm mm-hmm. not going to judge you either. That's my mm-hmm. that's my intention. It's my intention. As well. Your, your yeah. two is just to be mm-hmm. be there and let ask people to think about it mm-hmm. themselves. What they what can they do? Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you said that. Um, that you have come up with a practice that we could use mm-hmm. for, for healing. And I'm, I'm loving that. Now I, I got, I don't know if you want to share the PowerPoint or you just want to talk through it. Mm-hmm. Um, I can just talk through it if that's, that, if that works. I mean, if you, yeah, I, I don't that's think good. I, I just kept up. it up just in case I'm, I'm talking oh, to oh, it. If you, you can share, you can put it on the screen if you'd like to. That's totally well, fine. It's the last. Okay. I'm going to be, I, I'm, I think it's so I would, the, do, there's uh, a slide called concepts of healing together. And that might be a good place to start. I think it can okay, be let me see. Yeah, slide. Okay, let's see. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's the one I've got it on or aren't I good? Okay. okay. Yeah. Alrighty, let me see. Let's do this. Mm-hmm. Share screen. And I'm going to share this one. Okay. Okay. All right. So let's see if I can get in. Let's see if I can get in the pretty mode here. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. So that first block. Yeah. 
talks okay, about. All right. Mm -hmm. Looks good. That first box talks about how we can come together with the rest of the natural world to co-create healing. And you know, I, I put the, the concept of co-witnesses in there as well, because I think that's a really important part of the healing process is witnessing and being witnessed. And sometimes when we feel like we don't know what we can do, we become aware of something very hard. Maybe our role in that situation is just to bear witness, which has a power yeah. into it. I love that. I'm, I'm going to stop just for a second because that's um, one of the things that I have learned um, when we're connecting with animals with behavioral problems is if I if I see or understand or sense some of the um, trauma that they've been through, just hanging mm -hmm. out with them and saying, "Oh, that's just being there," and saying, "Wow, that is that's a terrible thing that you experienced," and just being with them mm -hmm. is Absolutely. part of the animal communication. I found that it, it, it's not. I, it doesn't work to skip over it if that's really stuck in their in their memories and in their experience. And so, yeah, that's a great word is witnessing because I'm not I'm just being there watching the watching it with them going, wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think that that nature can play that role with us as well. You know, I think about people especially who may have been through a lot of relational trauma and it doesn't necessarily feel safe to connect with other people. Sometimes animals and sometimes the natural environment can be there in a way that people have failed to be there in the past. And so, I mean, I can even think of, say someone has a beloved place in nature that they go with mm -hmm. just this incredibly beautiful tree there. And when hard things are happening, that's where they go. And to me, it's almost as though the tree is bearing witness to their experience. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah. So it's it's a sense of relationship with the rest of nature. It's not seeing the rest of nature as objects or something to dominate, but the relationship is a possibility. And so I think this is really based in having an openness to a new way of relating because for many of us, for me, it was a new way of relating with nature. Um, so I think starting with an open heart to that and, and to look for those opportunities is, that's how I would lay the groundwork for the practice I'm gonna describe on the next slide. Um, and some examples of how to do that would be when you're in nature, when you're with your pet, you ask, what do you need versus what's in it for me? Because I think the dominant theme in our society is more about what we get out of it. And, and we, you know, there, that's even prevalent in talking about therapies related to nature. It's about yes. using nature for human well-being, and, and even the language reflects that. So it's a big change to think of it in this different way and ask nature, what do you need? And, and those ideas really sink in for me in reading the book I mentioned, Braiding Sweetgrass. And I was very grateful for that change of perspective. I, I, I like this. I, I haven't thought about that. What I, what, I, what I have done, and I do a lot, is um, when I walk around my neighborhood, uh, there's, a little, there's a little bit of a, a woods there. And, uh -huh. and I say hello as if I'm talking to the human neighbors in the I'm like, hey, I'm back again. How are how are you? And uh -huh. um, I'm so yeah. glad to be here. I'm glad we're part of you know we're we're part of each other's. We're living together, and um, I have a lot of fun. It's, I'm in my car, so you, nobody can hear me, but I'll help myself. Mm -hmm. I look up the clouds and say, "My, you're looking gorgeous today." <laughs> mm -hmm. It's just it's beautiful. beautiful. Yeah. So this is this is uh -huh. my fun way of connecting. I, and, but I haven't thought about asking what they need. So that's going to be something I'll add in. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if, if you'd like to, we can go to the next slide, which is the actual practices that incorporate these concepts. 
Okay, it's working. Okay. So I put this together based on my own experience. And so I like to share this and see how other people might be able to use it or if it, if it helps with their experience as well. And so the start would be incorporating the concepts we just talked about and being intentional in seeking reciprocity and relationship with the rest of nature. So that's a starting point. Okay. As I mentioned before, being open to surprising, it can be surprising, mutual healing that can come in unexpected ways. Like I, I could not have planned that, that situation with our dog and my son healing together. I had no idea that she would have separation anxiety also. And it was really unexpected and that was beautiful. So I think being open to those possibilities is part of the practice. And then Sometimes we need a way to capture the meaning of an experience. And story, I think, is a really good way to do that. We talked earlier about co-creating a story of healing. And so that can be internal in just the way you think about it. You know, just putting together in your mind, what happened here? Where did, where did this start? And where did we end up? And what happened with me? And what happened with the other aspects of nature that were present. And um, people express themselves in different ways. So this is a great opportunity to bring in a form of self-expression to capture what occurred, whether it's writing, photography, you know, some people's nature photography really brings out the story of how they relate to nature. Yeah. Art, painting. For me, this was totally unexpected, but poetry, surfaced as my way of trying to capture some of these you know ineffable experiences I had with the rest of nature uh, and to record it and it's almost like a tribute and so the last step which is of course optional um, is to share the story uh, because it's something that creates community other people can relate and that's, you know, I think a generative thing to do where we're connecting with others in this new way of relating that may work with work for them as well. So it can help us become more interconnected with our community. Um, we can we can share something and give back um, from our experience. Yeah. So that's that's another part of it. Thank you. So it feels like what we're doing today is possibly somewhat on that path mm -hmm. just by talking together. I, I feel that, yeah. You feel that too? Okay. I do, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Let me see. Have we got, should I go to the next slide? I, I, you know, I think that's all for the slides. Okay. Um, but we can keep talking. Oh, good. All right. All right. So, um, what could could you share about how you did this with the your rattlesnake? Oh, uh, sure. Yeah. yeah. I, I I didn't know if I was gonna. I didn't know if we talk about the horse or the rattlesnake, but uh, mm -hmm. but the rattlesnake sounds lovely because uh, again the background story of that you know how what your relationship is with mm -hmm. rattlesnakes how probably, mm -hmm. and how, yeah. how this happened. I, I'll, I'll just turn it back to you. <laughs> yeah, it was a really amazing experience. So, you know, growing up in New Mexico and, you know, spending a lot of time on ranches growing up, um, you know, rattlesnakes are viewed as an enemy and there's a lot of killing of rattlesnakes and, you know, even, even just because they existed. And I think it's kind of an idea that a lot of us fall into of certain categories of animal are bad. It's like, that's a bad animal, this is a good animal. And that's taken me a long time to work through and think of in a different way. Um, and so, you know, considering those experiences, a lot of it was, a lot of that I think is fear-based where 
people as a society decided they need to protect themselves from a certain category of animal if it's a predator or if you know it's a snake and you know even you know the the biblical imagery of of the snake as an evil being who's leading you astray it, you yeah. know that that story seeps into our collective psyche and there are other <laughs> stories so it's kind of like tapping into other stories. responsibility for our own badness let's not blame it on the snake <laughs> yeah. I'm yes. sorry. yeah 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 so anyway so it's a good you know, story but really we yeah know, we, 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 yeah Yes. So, I mean, there are other, there are so many other stories going back to ancient times, healing powers of snakes. And so it's kind of broadening our awareness of why do we think about animals a certain way and, and what are the possibilities? But, you know, so I was hiking and for some reason, this just came into my consciousness um, about the rattlesnakes and I wanted a different experience with rattlesnakes. And uh, I was walking along a ridge, having these thoughts. And it was kind of like a conversation in my mind with a rattlesnake. It was, you know, thought of, you know, I would like to, I would like to see you uh, in a respectful way. You know, let's not surprise each other. <laughs> to do that um and uh i wasn't heavily focused on it. it they were kind of lightly held thoughts and lo and behold i turned around and and started my return trip and right there under a creosote bush was a huge rattlesnake coming out from a hole and you know it's very broad, wide, stretched skin. And I, you know, did some looking into it and I believe that it was a uh, pregnant female. Gravid is the term that's used for snake, but um, just basking in the sun, um, lying there. And I just, it was, I was awestruck, you know, internally I was just speechless and all I could think was thank you. Um, and it was a very different experience. And I was, you know, I kept a respectful distance and just really admired the snake's beauty, took a picture and then uh, went on with my walk. And uh, it was a beautiful experience. And so after that, I wrote a poem about it to try to capture the meaning of the experience. And so for me, that was the way I did the practice that I just described of, um, co-creating a story mm -hmm. and uh, it did feel like and I'm not trained in this but I, I'm interested in your thoughts it did feel like communication with the snake it, it um oh uh, yeah it, let me say so there are you know totems um like archetypes and i almost feel like that there was a how do we say a lovely joy in being requested to be seen in a different way and the response was all right i'm sending my mm -hmm. i'm sending somebody up to say hi just to but you know, I got the message. Thank you so much. And um, this, this snake feels like it's an emissary almost mm -hmm. yeah. to, to say how nice, how nice to be seen in a different way. I'm just, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And that you were a gift to the snake as well. How interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, it was reciprocal. Mm -hmm. And the vulnerability of seeing a snake who's gravid has going to have babies. There's just a, another realm of trust being given mm -hmm. to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's such symbolism with that. The, mm -hmm. You know, fertility, possibility, something coming forth. It's really beautiful. It is really beautiful. So yeah, lovely. Thanks Thank you for, for asking me.
Yeah, that Did you want to share your poem? I I could read it if there's time. I don't want to take up too much time. Well, let's, let's do it. And um, okay. Okay, let's do it because I, I loved it. Let's do it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I called this poem On the Way Back. Trekking the winding spine of a desert ridge, spiny tufts of so tall Nopal mesquite blurred as I became lost in conversation. Let's not surprise each other, I thought, though I'd like to see you from a respectful distance. Shy thoughts, lightly held, addressed with admiration, a touch of fear, and no expectation. Imagine my fluttering heart, stopping feet, disbelief, as I saw what I missed on the first pass. Gravid body emerging from the earth, keratin tail, zebra striped rings, diamonds stretched and bulging, basking, still, chiseled head, viper eyes, overlooking fertile curves. Thank you, I said. It was all I could muster. And I kept my dog close on the way back. That's beautiful. I'm glad we shared mm -hmm. that. Thank you. Experience. Thank you for asking me to share that. Yeah, I, I and I hope it's um we we all stop and think about those animals that we put in the into the bad category and see if we can um try another way of, of having a relationship mm -hmm. with them. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, beautiful and unexpected things can come from that. I, well, I thank you so much for this. Um, thank you, Maribeth. This has been lovely. It's wonderful to be to have this conversation. I mean yeah, so much fun. to me. And... Yeah, me too. I, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to um, put some information about you in the video and and uh, and in my blog and and hopefully okay. people will contact you if they're interested and um, I would love to hear anybody else's experiences with nature or their own animals and how there, there's a mm -hmm. reciprocal nature instead of the hierarchical and how is mm -hmm. that healing yeah. all right Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you so much, Fairbeth. All righty. Sure.